Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar, DCM and Women, One Incredible Story of Survival and Hope. We're going to get just started in uh, just a minute at 6 p.m. Everyone is on mute upon joining. And it is six o'clock. Good evening, everyone. I am Jayanne Rock of the DCM Foundation. We're so glad you could join us this evening. We're gonna get started right away this evening because we have a lot of very interesting and uh, informative information to share tonight. This webinar is DCM and Women, One Incredible Story of Survival and Hope. All participants uh, are on mute upon joining so we can hear the presenters. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. We will have a Q&A portion of the presentation at the end. Next slide, thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know, the DCM Foundation was founded in 2017 with the mission to provide hope and support to DCM patients and their family members through research, advocacy, and education. We'd like to do a quick poll tonight just see who's joining us. Uh, if you're a patient, just click the appropriate button. If you're a patient, family member, medical provider, or other, and we will share the results in just a quick moment, just to get an idea who's on with us tonight. Excellent, I'm just watching the numbers go up here. I think a couple of people are probably still joining us. Excellent, looks like we have, um, I'm gonna end the polling here. Looks like we have about half of the folks are patients um, and then a third are medical providers and then family members and some others. So that's um, excellent. I think everyone will get some good value out of tonight's webinar. Next slide, Heather. I do wanna also introduce Heather Musgrove is helping us behind the scenes with the technology as always, she's a rock star. Um, tonight's presenters, we have Dr. Kathy Crispell, who's a cardiovascular disease and advanced heart failure and transplant specialist. She's also a DCM Foundation board member and mentor to Dr. Gupta. Dr. Nandita Gupta is with us tonight as well. She is a medical director of cardiovascular service line at OHSU, Hillsborough, Health Hills, Hillsborough Medical Center and Assistant Professor of Medicine at Knight Cardiovascular Institute. Dr. Gupta leads the Women's Heart Program at the Center for Women's Health at OHSU. She is an experienced cardiologist with special interest in heart failure and heart disease in women and is passionate uh, about advocacy for health equity. Dr. Gupta has published and presented science and clinical research papers exploring sex differences in heart disease. She is a fellow with the American College of Cardiology and board member of the American Heart Association of Oregon and Southwest Washington. Dr. Gupta was voted a top doctor in the Portland Monthly Magazine two years in a row, 2019 to 2020, and again, 2020 to 21. In her free time, she enjoys traveling with her family, reading, and hiking. Next slide. And I'm thrilled to also present tonight's guest speaker, Jen Rowe. Jen is a peripartum cardiomyopathy, stroke and heart transplant survivor. She is the founder and author of thismommiesheart.com. She is also the 2021 American Heart Association Go Red for Women Real Woman Ambassador. Jen went from being healthy and active to getting a heart transplant in only 50 days, showing that new moms need to be aware of heart disease risks. And without further ado, I would like to hand this over to Dr. Chris Bell. Dr. Chris Bell, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan. Dr. Gupta, thank you for participating in tonight's uh, webinar. Um, I'm going to open up our discussion tonight by asking you um, to explain to our audience what peripartum cardiomyopathy is and how common is it and its prognosis? Thank you, Dr. Crispell. That's a 
very provocative question. And also I think lays the foundation for our conversation this evening. So cardiomyopathy is broadly a disease of the heart muscle. There can be many different forms of cardiomyopathies. Peripartum cardiomyopathy is a very specific type of heart dysfunction that occurs towards the last half of pregnancy or the first few months post-pregnancy characterized by a reduction in the squeezing function of the heart. So the normal squeezing function of the heart is 60 to 65%. In peripartum cardiomyopathy, this squeezing function of the heart goes down to about 45%. It is important to recognize that this is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning if you have no other form of cardiomyopathy detected during your pregnancy, um, it is called peripartum cardiomyopathy. There are certain populations that are at higher risk, including women about the age of 30, women with any forms of hypertension complications during the pregnancy, African-American race, and women with multiple uh, pregnancies. The symptoms of peripartum cardiomyopathy can be very confusing and can often be mistaken for normal occurrences during pregnancy. The incidence of this condition varies somewhere in the range of 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 4,000 in the United States. Now, important to recognize is that we don't actually know the cause of peripartum cardiomyopathy. I've highlighted here many of the risk factors or many of the factors that have been proposed to cause this condition. The diagnoses, again, can be, as I shared earlier, difficult to make because some of the symptoms may mimic those of normal pregnancy. Majority of women with peripartum cardiomyopathy are actually diagnosed after delivery, so in the postpartum period. Typically, they have symptoms of shortness of breath, racing heart rates, uh, swelling in the legs, orthopnea as a specific term for shortness of breath when laying flat. PND refers to paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or needing to get up because you're gasping for air. Um, when there is a concern or a suspicion of peripartum cardiomyopathy, certain diagnostic tests, lab tests, such as like a beta natriuretic peptide may be helpful. Echocardiogram or an ultrasound of the heart is the most important test for diagnosing peripartum cardiomyopathy. Now, in terms of prognosis, you know, we recognize that peripartum cardiomyopathy is a lifelong condition. A patient's heart function may recover. This often happens in more than 50% of women and typically occurs two to six months. However, some patients may continue to have worsen heart function or the heart function may never recover. The heart size may be big. Certain populations um, may be more vulnerable to having a worse outcome. And in those patients, uh, there may be associated long-term survival reduction. Now, this peripartum cardiomyopathy can recover in subsequent pregnancies, particularly if the heart function does not recover. So in those cases, pregnancy may actually um, be contraindicated. Now, as we will hear from general story, there are many serious complications that can occur in peripartum cardiomyopathy. I will save that for Jen to share with us. In terms of future directions, what we recognize is that we don't know enough about this condition. We need more research to help determine what causes this, what are the specific treatment options and how can we improve the outcomes for patients and particularly those where the heart function doesn't recover or those that are associated with reduced survival? I hope that answers your questions, Dr. Crispell, and I'm open to more questions later. That's, that's really great, Dr. Gupta, and very informative. I think an important takeaway for our audience is that a BNP uh, and an echocardiogram are important and helpful tests to obtain if uh, a woman has symptoms consistent with heart failure during late pregnancy or in the early postpartum period. Um, Dr. Gupta, what's known about the genetics of peripartum cardiomyopathy? So uh, Dr. Crispell, I mean, we know a little bit about the genetics of peripartum cardiomyopathy and we're continuing to learn more. What we know is that about 15 to 20% of patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy may carry some mutations known to induce cardiomyopathies. Now, these specific mutations may be associated with, say, certain um, components of the heart 
muscle or heart structures such as titan, beta myosin, heavy chain, and lamin AC. We've also noticed that peripartum cardiomyopathy can cluster in families, and in about 6% of the cases, it can co-occur with dilated cardiomyopathy or increased in the size of the left ventricle. There are certain specific type of mutations such as single nucleotide polymorphisms that have also been shown to be associated with peripartum cardiomyopathy. But again, um, there is more we're learning over the years. Because of this, um, we recommend that screening of first degree relatives of patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy be done both for women who have known first degree relatives with dilated cardiomyopathy or peripartum cardiomyopathy. And the comprehensive screening could include a complete history and physical and electrocardiogram and an echocardiogram of the heart. That's a, a very important message for our audience. Um, and I, I'll, I'll just like to um, emphasize that pregnant women who have a sibling, a parent or a child with a history of idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy should be screened. And pregnant women who have a mother or a sister who have been diagnosed with peripartum cardiomyopathy should also be screened. So Dr. Gupta, um, in, in closing, um, pregnancy is a condition that is definitely unique to women. Um, so in, in closing, would you explain some of the concerns and potential issues related to pregnancy in women who have dilated cardiomyopathy from any cause? That's a great question, Dr. Crispell, because as we know, pregnancy, some have called pregnancy nature's free stress test. It's a period of profound changes in a woman's body. The volume of blood in the body increases, the vascular resistance decreases, heart rate increases. There are all kinds of changes that happen in the body, so much so that some cardiologists have recommended avoiding pregnancy in women who have any form of dilated cardiomyopathy, particularly if their heart function is reduced. However, um, to not take away any choices from women, I would advocate that er at the very least, women with dilated cardiomyopathy who are considering pregnancy should have a consultation with a cardiologist. Um, there is an emerging field of cardioobstetrics, meaning cardiologists specific specializing in management of pregnancy and associated heart conditions. Now, also important to recognize that some of the medications may need to be modified, even with the known diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy. For example, during pregnancy, there are certain medications such as ACE inhibitors and ARBs, which are contraindicated. Aldosterone antagonists are contraindicated. There are certain other medications that can be safely continued during pregnancy. And um, those conversations are important to have. Again, at the time of delivery, there are big shifts in volume and blood pressure and heart rate that occur. So delivery in these populations need to be very carefully managed and planned ahead. Also in the nursing period, there are a lot of myths around whether women with dilated cardiomyopathies can nurse and if how will that affect their heart, and we have learned much more about that now. Additionally, medications are, that are not safe in pregnancy can be, reduced, can be resumed during lactation, such as inalopril, and they are compatible with breastfeeding. Some have also advocated for using blood thinning medications, anticoagulations, particularly if the heart function is much severely reduced, it can cause um, formation of blood clots in the heart and pregnancy itself is considered to be a hypercoagulable state. So some have advocated for using blood thinners and some of these blood thinners can be in, need to be injected. So those conversations are very important and subsequent after, after pregnancy, planning for future pregnancies and discussing contraception, discussing whether an implantable defibrillator or defibrillator needs to be worn are the reasons for us um, uh, to have a very close conversation with your physicians and particularly your cardiologists. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's uh, really important information. Just So just to be clear for our audience, so some of those medications that can't be taken during pregnancy that you're referring to are medications that actually treat people that have congestive heart failure or heart failure. That's a can be associated with dilated cardiomyopathy. Is that correct, Dr. Gupta? Absolutely. Um, if I may walk you back um, 
I may not be able to walk you back to that slide, but certain medications that are used for dilated cardiomyopathy, such as beta blockers and diuretics, um, can be safely continued during pregnancy. We have done a lot of science and a lot of good information has emerged that these medications can be safely continued. Similarly, since we cannot use ACE inhibitors and ARBs, we can substitute them for medicines like hydralazine and isodyl, which are vasodilators, we can safely continue digoxin. So knowing which medications to stop and what to substitute and which medications to continue with is an important conversation uh, to have with your physicians and particularly your cardiologists. That's, uh, that's great information. So, um, so thank you very much, Dr. Gupta. That was a excellent, um, a, uh, and very informative presentation and a lot of information given in a uh, short period of time. So you, you did great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Um, Cristel, and thank you for the invitation. Oh, you're, you're welcome. So now I'm going to shift ge gears. And um, um, now it's my honor to introduce our guest speaker, Jen Rowe. Uh, Jen has an incredible story of survival and hope uh, for everyone who has dilated cardiomyopathy. Jen had the sudden onset of heart failure shortly after the birth of her second child, and she was diagnosed with peripartum cardiomyopathy. So thank you for, per, per, for participating tonight, Jen, and uh, please uh, share your incredible story with our audience. Okay, let me get this slide going, if I can get it to go. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Um, so with this pregnancy, it was my second pregnancy. And, um, you know, it was pretty similar to my first pregnancy, but when I look back, there were things that were a little bit different. Um, one thing was that I gained almost double the weight that I did with my first pregnancy. Um, and I was very swollen, especially in those later months of pregnancy. I also, um, in those later months, had a lot of nighttime urination, which was, you know, strange to me. Um, but uh, when I brought both the weight gain and the um, nighttime urination up with my doctor, you know, those were pretty typical sort of pregnancy symptoms. So we didn't really think there was anything that we had to be worrying about. Uh, one thing, though, that did concern my doctor while I was um, pregnant was I was at one point pushing my son in a cart in a parking lot and I actually started feeling very ill and ended up blacking out in the parking lot and I had to you know hold on to the cart and you know kind of sit down for a minute and try to recover um, but he we did an, an ECG to see if everything you know looked okay and it actually came back normal so I thought it was just a one-time thing and that I would you know, be fine because, you know, everything, everyone was telling me everything was normal pregnancy symptoms and, you know, my test results came back normal. So I thought I didn't have anything to worry about. Um, moving on to uh, when I had my daughter, I had her on November 15th of 2017. It was a uh, normal labor and delivery. I had no complications when I was actually having her, but, um, yeah, and I thought I, I was kind of over the hump. She was healthy. I thought everything was kind of going perfect. Uh, we were discharged about 36 hours after she was born because everything was, you know, supposedly going really well. But five days after I had her, I really started experiencing some odd symptoms. Um, the first one that I noticed is that I was very tired, but I didn't think this was necessarily a very big deal because you know, I was a mom and I was taking care of a two-year-old and a newborn. So moms are supposed to be tired. So I just thought that was expected, you know, part of the, the being a mom life. But uh, a few days later, I was breastfeeding my daughter and I, I noticed that I was having trouble breathing. Uh, and I had no history of heart issues. So my heart never came to my mind. Um, I actually thought I was having some sort of panic attack, uh, having anxiety. I really wasn't sure what the issue was. I eventually calmed myself down and went to sleep, but the next day um, I was beyond tired and 
really the last straw was when I was trying to go up a flight of stairs in my house. I made it up about two stairs and I couldn't make it any further. I was literally on my hands and knees crawling up to um, my bedroom where I had to just lay on my bed for several minutes and, and try to be able to breathe again. And I knew at that point I needed to go to the hospital and um, you know see what the issue was. Um, luckily my parents were in town. So my dad was able to take me to the hospital. Um, I was breastfeeding, so my daughter had to come along with us. And when we got there, uh, they did my vitals and they found that my heart rate was over 150, which is obviously very high. And um, they decided to admit me to run some additional tests. And it was at that point they did the echocardiogram and the uh, BNP test along with several other tests. And they found uh, with the echocardiogram that my ejection fraction was 18% and my BNP level was over 10,000. Um, at that point, you know, I found out, I was told the words that I uh, had peripartum cardiomyopathy and that I could never, ever, ever have um, another child. And from there, uh, you know, I was at um, a army hospital and uh, they knew that they weren't able to care for me at that point. So at that point I was transferred to a bigger hospital. Um, once I got to the University of Washington, which is where um, they transferred me to, their first um, plan of action was to place a defibrillator. But once they got into my chest, they realized that my heart was failing very drastically, failing on both sides and I was placed on ECMO. Um, ECMO is the highest form of life support. It's uh, where your blood is put through a machine and oxygenated and put back into your body, essentially allowing your heart to rest. They kind of just wanted to give my heart a chance to possibly recover or just see what it was going to do. Um, but they had to decide in the end to either place an LVAD, which is a device that assists your heart or remove my heart and replace it with a total artificial heart, um, also known as a TAH. <laughs> Um, they told me that, or they told my family, I don't really remember much from this point, but um, they told them that they would make the decision once they were in my chest. And, you know, once they went in and started to do the surgery, it, it, my heart was too far gone and my heart was removed and replaced with the total artificial heart. Um, let's see. So um, the total artificial heart was my bridge to transplant. And, you know, it kept me alive and, you know, I probably wouldn't be here without it, but it came with a lot of complications. Um, and, you know, there was the possibility of a lot of complications and I had a lot of complications. Not many days um, after I woke up from getting the total artificial heart, I, um, the machine um, that kind of runs the total artificial heart that was inside of me started acting very weird. The, feel, the fills were going off. And you know, they took me back to the OR, they knew something was wrong. And they told my family that they literally rolled me into the OR and the machine stopped working. And you know, they emergently had to open my chest to relieve the pressure because it turned out that I had a tamponade and I had a bleeding around my heart and it had you know, messed up what the TH was supposed to be doing. Um, since they had to work so emergently, they told my family that there was a period of time where they didn't have my blood pressure so um, they didn't know if I was actually going to wake up neurologically sound because they just had no track of my, my blood pressure. Luckily, you know, everything was fine, but um, that was definitely a, a big concern when they were waiting for me to wake up to make sure that I was okay. Uh, you know, I, I continued living with the, the total artificial heart while I was in the hospital and, you know, recovering. I spent Christmas in the hospital and, you know, things were going well for a while, but right before the new year, I was um, actually sitting with my family and I started to feel very weird. And I, you know, my left hand felt weird. That was the main thing that I noticed first. And I put my hands out in front of me and I was trying to lower them at the same time. But each time I would lower my hands, my left one would go down a lot faster. And my brain just wasn't really working and I didn't know what the problem was. Um, and the only thing I could say to my family was heavy and I'm, to me, I meant that my, my hand was heavy and I didn't know why, but I couldn't say anything else. So I was just like heavy, heavy, heavy. Um, and, you know, they knew something was wrong. So they, they paged the nurse, but I just kept getting more and more agitated. And um, eventually my husband asked me to look at him and he saw one side of my face was starting to droop 
and he immediately knew that I was having a stroke. So he pressed the code button that was in my room and, you know, ran out into the hall and alerted the nursing station that I had had a, I was having a stroke. Um, and, you know, they quickly took me down to have a CT scan. I wasn't able to get an MRI because I did have the total artificial heart at the time. Um, after I did have the total artificial heart removed, however, they were able to do the MRI. And what they found out is that a clot had broken off from the total artificial heart and then broke apart again and gone up both sides of my brain, resulting in a, um, a bilateral stroke. So, um, you know, I ultimately, I recovered from the stroke pretty well. I do have some residual weakness, but I was pretty lucky that I didn't have any long-term sort of effects from it. Um, you know, I spent most of my time in the hospital trying to bond with my baby. I, I was a, a new mom to her. So um, in this picture, you can see I'm trying to have some skin to skin time. I didn't have a lot of skin to give her um, because I did have so many tubes coming out of my body. But, um, you know, I tried to bond with her. I walked her in the stroller during my walks and and all of that. But, you know, I was really just trying to recover because there was the opportunity for me to go home with the total artificial heart um, and with something called the freedom driver, which is essentially a smaller version of the total artificial heart that you can be worn in a bag or in a backpack. Um, but I luckily um, did not have to end up going home with the total artificial heart because on January 7th of 2018, I found out that there was a heart available for me. And the following day, uh, they were able to schedule my surgery. I went down to the OR and um, you know I remember them putting me to sleep, but it turns out just a few maybe hours later, I woke up in the exact same room to find out that it was going to be a dry run and actually the heart was not coming. Um, there was nothing wrong with the heart, but it turned out that there was a weather advisory where the heart was coming from. So it had to be delayed a day. And, um, but they luckily they were able to schedule the surgery for the next day. Uh, when I went down for the surgery, everything was going great. A heart transplant um, is a very long surgery. So my family expected it to take a while. Um, but after several hours, the surgeon did come up and tell them that everything had gone great. It was perfect. The heart was in, it was pumping and, you know, they just needed to do for a few more things and close me up and, you know, it would be, they, they would get to see me soon. Um, but they, you know, they waited and they were continuing to wait for hours and hours and hours. And they eventually um, heard from the surgeon that right as they were about to finish closing me up and put me into the elevator, the heart had stopped working due to primary graft dysf dysfunction. And they had to place me back on ECMO. From this point, they told them that there was a 50-50 chance that the heart would start working again. Um, and you know, if it, it did start working again, it would be fine and the heart would be fine and I would be able to keep it you know, for a very long time. But if it didn't start working again, I would have to get a, another transplant and I would have to get it right away. And this is not ideal because you know, with my first heart, they were able to be picky and pick the very best heart for me. But when you need an emergent heart transplant, they kind of has, have to pick whatever will work and it doesn't necessarily have to be a great heart. Um, luckily, however, after a few days, they did go into my chest and do a washout and they found that the heart was working and I was able to come off the ECMO and then I started the process of you know, getting better and recovering from the transplant. Um, by the end of the month, of the end of January, I was doing better. Um, you know, I worked with PT and OT and I learned all of my medications and, and everything. And I was, I was finally able to go home, um, which was great. While I was home, I continued to do um, in-home PT and OT. And eventually I went into cardiac rehab and completed that program. But really the main goal was just to get back to my normal life and, you know, be a mom to my kids and, and just get back to everything that I, I wanted to do. And one thing that has always been really important to me and to my family that we really love doing is to travel. And uh, actually just five months after my transplant, you know, we started doing that again. We uh, traveled to uh, Disney World 
um, in June, nonetheless, um, which it was hard to do that. It was, um, you know, difficult to get around and all that heat. And, you know, it was a lot of activity just five months after my transplant, but I did it and I was really proud of myself. And, you know, I had a really good time. And three months after that, we did a California road trip where we got to go to Disneyland and a bunch of national parks and the San Diego Zoo and, you know, just trying to get back to that normal life. And it wasn't always easy. And there were times when I didn't feel good and I needed to rest, but, you know, I was really happy that I got to go out and kind of start living a normal life again. When it seemed, when I was in the hospital, I would never get to be able to do those things again. Uh, about a year after my transplant, I did reach out to my donor's family. Um, and a few months after that, they did get back to me and we were able to schedule a time to meet. Um, it was really great meeting them um, and getting to learn about uh, their son, my donor. And, you know, we still keep in touch via social media. And that's a, a very special relationship that I was able to have or I am able to have. So it was great meeting them. Um, but ultimately, my life is pretty much back to normal for the most part. I take a lot of medications and I have a lot of doctor's appointments, but you know, as time goes on past my, my transplant, those doctor's appointments are less and the medication that I have to take, you know, has decreased and, you know, life is getting pretty back, pretty much back to normal. I'm a stay at home mom, just taking care of my kids. And uh, one thing that has come out of this is I have a, a great desire to, you know, spread awareness about peripartum cardiomyopathy. It's something that I didn't know about, and it's very important to me to get the word out about this condition so people can know the signs and symptoms, and hopefully, you know, no one has to go through what I did or even worse. So that's my goal, and um, thank you so much for letting me share my story. I really appreciate it. That's an incredible story, uh, Jen, um, and uh, thank you so much for sharing it with us and our audience uh, today. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions for you. And if you do have questions, please go to the bottom of your screen and enter your questions in the Q&A box. Um, there's a couple of points I'd like to um, just emphasize in your story. So as Dr. Gupta said, sometimes the, um, the, the symptoms can be confused with uh, the normal symptoms of late pregnancy. Um, and so you mentioned, Jen, that uh, in your pregnancy, and I'm assuming this was in your third trimester, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you had more edema than you had perhaps in your previous um, pregnancy. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And then you had this other symptom that we call nocturia, which is getting up and going to the bathroom a lot at night. So both of those can occur during normal pregnancy, um, but um, also those are, you know, especially with more edema than your previous uh, pregnancy uh, and a frequent nocturia, those can be symptoms of heart failure. And so, but you can see how easily it can be confused with just normal symptoms of, of pregnancy. So, um, so that's one thing. And, uh, and, and Dr. Gupta did make that point in her presentation. The other, the other symptom that you mentioned, Jen, was when you were pushing your son and you had that episode where you felt like you were gonna black out. Um, at what point in your pregnancy did that occur? Um, it was definitely sometime in my third trimester. I don't remember exactly when, I think probably in the earlier end of it, but um, yes. And then at that point, the, the ECG was ordered, but it came back completely normal. So that's, again, you know, maybe that could be a symptom related to pregnancy as well, but it, it alarmed you, it sounded like to me, um, you know, that um, they, that was pretty unusual for you. And so, you know, that's something, you know, that may increase a symptom like that may in just increase one's awareness that there may not be something quite right. And um, so, and then you mentioned the profound fatigue. Um, so people can get fatigued in pregnancy, especially late pregnancy, but the profound fatigue that you mentioned, that's a little unusual. 
Um, and uh, again, that can that profound fatigue can be a symptom of of uh, cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure. Um, so, and then the other symptom that you mentioned is that you just got so fatigued just going up two step, you know, two steps in your home, mm -hmm. where you actually had to crawl up the steps and then recover basically once you got to your bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in, a, in the, the way doctors and healthcare providers think about that, that's decreased exercise tolerance, kind of a classic um, symptomology of really not being able to do what you normally are able to do. And, and that should be kind of a, uh, something to pay attention to. So uh, just for our audience, I think your, your story really points out um, some, some clues to peripartum cardiomyopathy, but also how easily some of these clues can be confused with signs and symptoms of, of late pregnancy. So, um, and then um, the other thing, you know, you, you definitely had a lot of complications uh, related to your peripartum cardiomyopathy. That is, you ended up needing to be mechanically supported. Um, and so, you know, the lower the ejection fraction is, the higher the risk is. And you certainly fit in that category. And also your, um, your, your African-American um, background is a risk factor uh, for uh, worse outcome. And so, you know, those are some important things. And you did have a stroke during your, um, your, your, uh, your treatment period, but your stroke was probably due to the mechanical total artificial heart and not necessarily mm -hmm. just to the condition of peripartum cardiomyopathy, but stroke, the risk of stroke or other, um, uh, problems related to blood clots being broken off from inside um, a sick heart, uh, a heart with peripartum cardiomyopathy, that is at women are increased risk of having those kinds of events. And that's why anticoagulation is recommended. So again, just to emphasize some of the points that Dr. Gupta made. So with that, um, I will open up um, to our audience, uh, any uh, questions that people may have? Sure, um, and actually, um, let me tee up a question for you here. Um, Robin says, Jen, what an amazing recovery story. Bless you for your strength and tenacity. Did genetic testing in your family show a familial connection for this type of peripartum cardiomyopathy? Did you have um, I, I have just submitted my genetic testing. Um, literally on Monday, I submitted it. So I don't have those results yet, but um, I'm very interested to find out if there is something there. And then if there is, possibly see if that's something that I have passed on to my children, because that's really my main concern at this point is, you know, if there is something my children need to be worried about. Right, absolutely. Did, so, did you... So so can I interject here? Um, so one thing that's very interesting in Jen's background is Jen is adopted. Jen, and so, so, you know, we don't really, she doesn't really know much about her, her um, biologic um, family background. And so genetic testing is actually very important for her. So since we don't have any family history to go by for, for Jen. Right, thank you. Thank you for that information. Um, you know, we have a, a quick poll I'd just like to put up because I think it's um, relevant at this point, just to know where our audience is in their understanding. Um, sorry, I need to relaunch the next poll. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna try to put up this sec poll for some reason it's not coming up. That's okay, we'll skip it. I was gonna ask uh, how many folks are actually familiar with this kind of, um, oh, here it is. Mm -hmm. how, are, how familiar are you with the condition of peripartum cardiomyopathy? You know, before this presentation tonight, 
have you ever heard of this? Are you very familiar with it? Somewhat familiar or not at all familiar? Um, and it, it's interesting because of course on your blog, Jen, you know, you're really trying to get the word out. And um, I know there's a Facebook support group as well. Um, I'm not sure if you're a member of that group, Jen, but it did look like it's, it's quite an active group. Could you speak to mm -hmm. that at all? Um, yeah, for sure. So on my blog, I have over the past few months been trying to share a lot of different stories um, from people who have peripartum cardiomyopathy and they run the gamut. There are people who have, you know, been diagnosed with it and they've been able to recover with just medication. Um, there are also those who, you know, have had to get a life vest for a few months. Um, and I also have, I have one uh, woman who had her baby at the, you know, in the middle of the pandemic. And within a few months, she was getting her heart transplant all by herself um, due to peripartum cardiomyopathy. So there is, you know, a whole, whole gambit of um, things that can happen. Um, I'm actually going to be writing a story very soon about a, uh, a young woman, a young mom who passed away at the beginning of this year. Um, she passed away in her sleep due to peripartum cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's very scary. And there's a lot of us that are very passionate about it to get the word out because, you know, we don't want to, our kids or anybody else's kids to be without their mothers. No, no, it's, it's such an important topic. Um, and, and the support group um, is also um, a really great place, um, especially for people who have been diagnosed with peripartum cardiomyopathy. Um, it's very active. If you have questions, you'll usually get a ton of responses and um, it's a very supportive community. So I definitely would recommend it. Oh, fantastic. Um, I will share the poll results now. Um, so this is, this is obviously very helpful for folks. Um, you know, we have almost 40% are very, very familiar with the condition, 43% somewhat, um, and about 20% not at all familiar. So you know, getting the word out, I think, um, is, is really critical. Let me share a couple of additional questions that have come up here. Um, is, is um, sorry, I just, there was something came up on my screen. I'm sure what that was. Um, to, the, to the doctors, um, what is the percent of women with P PPCM who need a heart transplant? Is that um, kind of, is that a, a rare event or is that uh, somewhat common for women to need a heart transplant when they have this condition? I think it's definitely a rare event. It is, uh, Jen's story is so un inspiring, but it's also very unusual and a highly rare condition. As I shared about 50% of women, more than 50% of women heart function recovers completely. There have been some recent studies that have shown that the predictors for heart function recovering are the overall ejection fractions. So the squeezing function of the heart, the lower the ejection fraction, the less likely is the heart function to recover. And the dilated ventricle, how big is the lower left ventricle or the chamber of the heart, the bigger the ventricle, the less the chances of recovery. So we can use some of those parameters to predict. But again, uh, progressing to the stage of requir requiring total artificial heart and heart transplant is an extremely rare condition. I don't know, Dr. Crispell, if you'd like to add to that. Oh, I think uh, that's a perfect answer. Uh, fortunately, um, Jen is, uh, Jen's story is not a common story. My, me being a transplant cardiologist, of course, I've seen quite a few women with peripartum cardiomyopathy that have needed to go on to be transplanted or supported with mechanical devices. But, you know, that's not the most um, common scenario. So fortunately... Okay, thank you so much. Um, and Jen, um, what advice can you give women and their family members to help them navigate the challenges of having DCM as a new mom? I think that's a great question. Um, for me, especially when I was sick, it was my support system was so important to me. Um, knowing that I didn't have to worry that my kids were being taken care of and kind of being able to focus on my myself, you know, I had my my parents and also, you know, my husband's parents and our siblings and so many people who came out to help us when I was going through that. And it was such 
so helpful that, you know, I could focus on my health, my husband could be with me. And we still knew that our children were being taken care of, you know, my kids are my top priority. So I, I, if I didn't know that they were being taken, taken care of well, I would, don't, I don't know if I could have recovered as well. Right. As a mom, I can only imagine, I understand the feeling of your, your kids come first, even before you, although they mm-hmm. say you put your own mask on first, of course, when you're flying, that's the analogy they usually use. Um, um, do you have any dietary restrictions now as a result of this condition? Um, not due to peripartum cardiomyopathy, but due to my heart transplant, I do have restrictions. I, I am immunocompromised due to the medication that I take. So I kind of describe it as I'm on the pregnancy diet for life. I, um, you know, I have to have um, all my meat cooked thoroughly and my eggs cooked thoroughly and, you know, no like all my fruit needs to be washed really well and, and everything like that. So that's the, that's the main difference. It isn't, it isn't anything too crazy, but um, just something that I watched out for. Okay, thank you. Um, you were told that you should never become pregnant again. Does this still apply since you were transplanted? Um, yes, I had been informed that I should not get pregnant again. Um, because they do not know what caused my peripartum cardiomyopathy. And, um, you know, it could have been something specific to my old heart, possibly, or it could be something that attacks my heart and it could attack my new heart. And, you know, that would be disastrous. I want to try to keep this heart as long as possible. So, you know, I'm going to try to do everything I can to to keep it healthy. And yeah, we're we're good with the two kids. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Great. Thank you. and this is for the, the doctors. Do most obstetricians know about this condition and to consider it when these symptoms appear in new moms? Um, you want me to take that, Dr. Gupta? Sure, sure Dr. Crispo. All right, and you can chime in and add whatever if I uh, don't give complete information. Yeah, I think, uh, yes, I think most obstetricians are aware of this condition. However, you know, it's, it's not clear to me how many of them have actually taken care of or identified people with this condition, you know, because most pregnant women obviously don't end up with peripartum cardiomyopathy. It's a pretty, pretty unusual uh, condition. So, so, um, so there probably are many obstetricians that have never seen a case but um, but I'm sure that they are all aware of this condition. Do you, do you have anything different to add or or to add anything to that, Dr. Gupta? That was very well stated, Dr. Crispell. I agree with you. I think most medical phys- providers, physicians, obstetricians, gynecologists, family practice doctors who participate in um, child uh, delivery are aware of this condition. Uh, one of the things that we highlighted, both um, Genro, myself, and Dr. Crispell highlighted that condition may be underdiagnosed because the symptoms so much mimic um, a normal symptoms that can occur in later half of the pregnancy. So vigilance on the part of both the physicians, the providers, as well as um, pregnant women and patients to advocate for themselves. And as so many of you have done today, learning more about conditions such as these so that you're in a position to ask questions if you notice something unusual happening in your pregnancy. Um, I I would encourage uh, all participants to think about that. Um, I have a quick question if I can. Mm -hmm. Um, So peripartum cardiomyopathy is not something that is actually being tested for. You're usually only being tested if you have symptoms, but is it possible that more people could have peripartum cardiomyopathy and just recovering because you can recover from it and you could possibly just have a mild case of it and recover from it without actually, you know, ever being diagnosed with it? Yes, most definitely. Um, again, we're, you know, the the prevalence of it is is quite variable depending upon where you are in the world, and so it's really hard to track, you know, just how often it actually occurs. Um, and that, those are the obvious cases. So there are probably cases that are not obvious that are missed, and and people, 
you know, do recover from it. So, but we have no really, we have really no idea of how often that really is occurring. Um, but one thing I, I was going to say is, you know, a test that can be done very easily and, um, and fairly inexpensively is the B and P test, which is a blood test. And, and so if there is any suspicion whatsoever, um, that can be easily done um, during pregnancy. And if it is, you know, the level is quite elevated, then that's a very strong clue that, you know, you may indeed have peripartum cardiomyopathy, and then you should have an echocardiogram. So just a simple blood test, if you're having symptoms that don't seem quite right, or, you know, and, and, and often it's the patient has this feeling that maybe something isn't quite right, you know, that needs to be paid attention to. That is a very easy test to obtain. And if it's normal, um, or just very, sometimes it become it can become very mildly elevated in pregnancy, but if it's in that range, then that's very reassuring that you do not have um, heart failure and, uh, and not likely peripartum cardiomyopathy. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, we had another question that came in um, for Jen. How did you learn about living with a new heart? It's an interesting. Um, how did I learn about living with a new heart? Um, well, basically, like, how am I living with it, I guess, is the, the question? I guess, or... uh, yeah, I think, you know, probably there's a psychological component as well as a physical component. So if you could maybe speak to, to each of those, if you're comfortable doing so. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, there were definitely a lot of emotions that went into it. You know, the first big shock was waking up and finding out that I didn't have a heart at all, that I, you know, had a total artificial heart. Um, but then, you know, coming to the realization that I would be having to, you know, get someone else's heart if I intended to keep living. And, you know, that, that definitely was a lot to take in, um, I did. There were a lot of times when I was very, very sad and it seemed very hopeless. And, um, you know, there was a lot of why me, but, you know, it's just the way that my body worked out. So, you know, I had to come to terms with that. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it, it's never been, I guess, necessarily weird or anything having a, a donor heart. I, I guess I've never thought too deeply about it, but, you know, adjusting my life to having it. And, you know, but basically this whole experience has made me very untrusting of my body. And, um, you know, that was the main thing. I kind of it made my body feel like a ticking time bomb kind of. And, you know, it took a while to get over that feeling like that I just made, you know, things could just like stop. And, you know, it's, it's very scary, like thinking that your heart could just stop and you just not be here anymore. But, you know, it took several months, maybe even a year to get over that sort of feeling. Oh, I, I can only imagine. Um, to the doctors, kind of as a follow-up question, um, what kinds of additional support mechanisms would you recommend to women diagnosed with this um, in terms of, you know, counseling support, et cetera? Is that uh, typical? thing that as a doctor you recommend to patients who are going through something like this? Absolutely. You know, um, as physicians, we want to take care of the whole patient and recognize the complexity of this condition. You know, you go in expecting to deliver a normal child and then you come out of it with a lifelong diagnosis and perhaps uh, some debilitating complications. So supporting the medical care, but also uh, recognizing the stress and the strain um, emotionally and psychologically that this places, we very often recommend counseling for our patients as they're recovering from any forms of um, acute illnesses post-pregnancy, but specifically for heart failure. Research has shown that heart failures um, and peripartum cardiomyopathy are associated with a lot of anxiety and depression. So providing appropriate psychological support, counseling, as well as medical therapy um, uh, for managing um, the, the stress associated with it. Uh, we routinely do that. 
Excellent, thank you. Dr. Chris Bell, you had said something to me a while ago about um, that the heart is the, is the one organ. What did you explain to me? And the reason that you, you're a cardiologist? Um, I, I said that the heart is, um, is the one organ in the body in which people have an emotional attachment to. And um, it's so it's not, it's like people don't have an emotional attachment to their liver <laughs> or to their kidneys, um, you know, but to the heart, the heart symbolizes, you know, throughout history, the soul and, uh, and love and, um, you know, one's being. And so there's an emotional attachment to the heart. And uh, that's something that's always kind of fascinated me. Um, so that's what I, that's what I've said to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I find that fascinating and, and so true. Um, I have um, just a couple more questions. Um, Jen, I was wondering um, if you're comfortable, if you could talk about the process of meeting your donor's family and, and who initiates that connection. How, how does that work? If you're comfortable talking about that. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, there was an organization that uh, procured my heart. They're responsible for all of that process. And they are also the organization that um, I reached out to to reach out to my donor family. So they're kind of like the in-between person who facilitates that and you know, makes that connection if both parties are interested. So um, about a year after my transplant, I did write a letter and I sent that to Life Center Northwest, which is the, the organization that procured my heart. And they sent that letter to the donor family. And then at that point, it was up to them if they wanted to get back to me. Um, I knew it was a possibility that I may never hear back from them. It kind of just depends. Like sometimes donor families don't want to meet their the recipients and sometimes re recipients don't want to meet donor families and you know that's completely respected in the organ donation process um, but I did hear back from them um, after a few months and um, they live not too far away from where I live so we arranged a time to meet and you know we just met at a park and hung out and you know they had picture albums with their son in them and you know tons of stories and um, it was really great to, to learn about him and, you know, it was a very emotional experience, but um, it was one I'm very happy that I, I got to have. Oh, that is amazing. Thank you so much. And again, it just reinforces how important organ donation is. Um, you know, maybe someday it'll be an opt out instead of an opt in process on our license when we're 16, but um, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's such an important thing to do. Um, I just wanted to remind folks, we do have some links that we've dropped into the chat um, and we will also follow up with an email with those resources as well as a recording of tonight's webinar. Um, I just want to thank everyone. I mean, this has been, this has been one of the more emotional um, or emotionally charged kind of uh, webinars I think we've done. And, and we just can't thank you enough, Jen, for sharing your story. I've seen some comments um, in the chat and so forth. Um, just you're such an amazing, strong survivor. And some people are talking about other groups they're a part of with women and new moms, and they're going to share your uh, blog, your website with those groups as well. So you're definitely you know, working toward getting the word out. We have a couple of additional questions here. Um, Oh, just about the importance of the psychological issues that go along with all of these health issues. Um, uh, this woman is a, a mental, a, a licensed uh, mental health support, licensed psychologist. Uh, she was diagnosed some number of years ago with this condition at three and a half months postpartum. And it took 15 years for her ejection fraction to reach normal and she's, she lives with an ICD uh, and has an arrhythmia. Many people, PPCM or not, survive cardiac arrest or have implanted devices, have, some, have mental health challenges that often go unaddressed. And she just wanted to point that out and make sure that people do seek out help and resources um, if, if you know, they're diagnosed with this and having any challenges. Um, thank you again so much uh, to everyone tonight. 
Um, let's move on to the next slide, if we could, Heather, and then um, or whoever's in charge of the slide now. Um, again, if you want to learn more about the DCM Foundation, you can um, go to our website, dcmfoundation.org. If you want to learn more about genetic testing, which is so important to understand um, you know, the, the familial component of DCM, uh, just click on genetic testing. There's also a link um, that we'll share in our follow-up materials. You can always email us at info at dcmfoundation.org and follow us on the various social media platforms. Uh, we do put out regular updates on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and of course, you probably want to check out that peripartum, peripartum cardiomyopathy group on Facebook as well. And then the, the last slide for tonight, uh, we are excited to announce our July webinar uh, is a very special event. It's being held Thursday, July 29th. We will send additional information in follow-up emails, 7.30 to 9.15 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, this is the result of a seven-year DCM study. It's the, the DCM Precision Medicine Study Results Reveal, it's being called. And um, DCM Foundation members are invited to attend this special event to learn the results of the study. You can register at dcmproject.com and we'll also send additional information and we'll have information on our website as well. Again, thank you ladies. Um, this has been really amazing um, to both Dr. Gupta, Dr. Crispell and Jen, Jen Rowe, thank you so much. This is an incredible story, uh, very inspiring and I'm sure uh, will really help a lot of folks. So thank you again. Be well and uh, stay safe, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you for joining us. Take care now. Good night. <laughs>